Good day and thank you for checking out the ACS Library. My name's Kyle and I aim to help you prepare for the private pilot checkride for free in just 14 minutes a day. In today's incredibly long video, we discuss charting symbology, how things are depicted on the VFR charts. This video's objective is to leave you confidently and correctly interpreting sectional and tack charts. Information for this video is gathered from the FAA's Aeronautical Chart User's Guide. A link is provided in the description. It is important to show up to your checkride with a current VFR sectional chart and a TAC chart if you fly near Bravo airspace or your assigned flight plan involves Bravo airspace. The charts have changed only a little bit recently. The K in front of the airport's ICAO identifier is no longer depicted. Back in my day, fuel services were depicted by three tick marks surrounding the airport. Now, they're depicted by four. In order to keep this video organized, we will split the chart symbols into seven sections. They are land features, airspace, airport information, special use airspace, comm and nav aids, miscellaneous information, and lastly, the tabs. We will begin with land features. Contour lines run along points of equal elevation. They are small gray lines spaced at 500 foot elevation intervals. The closer together they are, the steeper the terrain. Shaded relief, seen as shadows along the southeast side of this mountain, shows how terrain, such as mountains, might appear from the air. Different colored tints show ranges of elevation relative to sea level. The colors range from light green at sea level to dark brown for elevations above 12,000 feet MSL. Notice there is no bright yellow here, but we may see bright yellow on the charts. Bright yellow areas depict populated places. These patterns of yellow also match pretty closely to the pattern we should see the city lights form from the air at night. Man-made obstacles are depicted by one of these four symbols depending on type and altitude. The maximum elevation figure, or MEF, for each quadrant is depicted as a large, bold blue number with the altitude in thousands of feet depicted by the large number and hundreds by the small. Here, we have 2,800 feet. Flying at or above the maximum elevation figure, ideally, should guarantee one obstacle clearance, assuming one's altimeter is set correctly. The maximum elevation figures in quadrants where the highest obstacle is man-made, like this one, are determined by the following procedure. Take the elevation at the top of the obstacle, add a buffer of 100 feet to that, increase this value to the nearest 100, and we are left with our maximum elevation figure. If the highest obstacle was made by Mother Nature, we add a buffer of 300 feet instead. Take this value and raise it to the nearest hundred and call it a day. Here, we are left with 13,500. Lastly, isogonic lines depict the angular difference between true and magnetic north in an area. This covers land features. Time to move on to section 2, airspace. Alpha airspace is not depicted on sectional charts, but lies everywhere from flight level 180 to flight level 600. Bravo is depicted by all these solid blue lines, with the upper and lower limits of each shelf in hundreds of feet depicted in fraction format as shown in all these tiny pink boxes. The Bravo airport is surrounded by a 30 nautical mile radius Mode C veil depicted by a solid red line. Charlie airspace is depicted similarly to Bravo, but with red lines instead of blue. Altitude is still in the fraction format. If a T is involved, that means the airspace extends upward until reaching the Bravo airspace above it. Delta airspace is depicted by a dashed blue line. The upper limit of the airspace is depicted in hundreds of feet MSL. A minus sign means up to that altitude, but not including. Echo airspace has a ceiling of 17,999 feet MSL. Echo with its floor at 1,200 feet AGL exists everywhere that other class Bravo, Charlie, or Delta airspace does not exist. The floor extends down to 700 feet AGL inside of where magenta shading is shown, and down to the surface inside of dashed magenta lines. Echo with floors other than these three altitudes will be depicted inside of a blue zipper pattern. Gulf airspace exists underneath Echo. This covers airspace. Next, we move on to airport information. Using Ogden Hinckley Airport in Utah, the airport info will generally follow a format similar to the following. Not everything will be included if it is not present at the airport. First, we have the name of the airport, Ogden Hinckley, followed by the ICAO identifier, Oscar Gulf Delta. 
Up next, the control tower frequency at 118.7. Airports with multiple control towers may have multiple frequencies listed. Notice this is followed by a star and a little c here. The star indicates that the control tower is not always open, and the C lets us know that communications will continue on common traffic advisory frequency, where pilots broadcast their locations and intentions. Below this, we have our weather reporting frequency. Ogden's ATIS frequency is 125.55. You may also see ASOS or AWOS here. Below that, we've got some runway information. Up first is the runway's elevation. Ogden's runway falls at 4,473 feet MSL. The L preceded by the asterisk would mean that the runways do not remain lit 24-7. For lighting limitations and procedures, refer to the chart supplement. An L without the asterisk in front would depict an airport with runways remaining lit 24-7. The small number is the length of the longest runway in hundreds of feet. Here, we have an 8,100 foot runway. It is important to note that this number does not only include usable runway. For usable runway length to compare to takeoff and landing distance, refer to the chart supplement. This frequency lets us know that we can contact the Aeronautical Advisory Station for airport information on Unicom frequency 122.95. Standard runways have a left-hand traffic pattern. The abbreviation RP designates runways with a right-hand traffic pattern. Aircraft operating runways 17 and 21 would fly right turn traffic patterns. Airport towers equipped with a rotating beacon have the tower position depicted by a star. Airports with control towers are shown in blue, while uncontrolled airports are shown in magenta. Airports with the longest runway greater than 8,069 feet are illustrated in the same fashion as Ogden. Airports with the longest runway between 1,500 and 8,069 feet are depicted within a circle. And airports with no hard surface runways are depicted by just a circle and are non-existent in most places. Airports that one shouldn't land an airplane at unless it's an absolute emergency will be depicted as follows. Heliport, ultralight flight park, unverified, restricted, and abandoned. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, airports offering fuel services are charted surrounded by four tick marks. That concludes airport information. Moving on to the next section, we will cover special use airspace. Temporary flight restrictions and controlled firing areas are not depicted on sectional intact charts. TERSAs, or Terminal Radar Service Areas, are depicted outlined in black as shown here. This TERSA surrounds Palm Springs. Military operating areas are depicted by a red striped pattern. Alert areas are charted the same way, but marked with an alpha rather than the letters MOA. Military training routes are depicted by these thin grayish lines shown here in one of a few ways. Either we'll see VR or IR followed by either a three or four digit number. VR shows routes performed under visual flight rules and IR are performed under instrument flight rules. Routes with a three-digit code run above 1,500 feet AGL, while routes followed by the larger four-digit code are performed below 1,500 feet AGL. Restricted, warning, and prohibited areas are all depicted by a blue version of that striped pattern we saw earlier. R designates restricted, W is for warning, and P is for prohibited. National security areas are outlined in thick red dashes, typically with information listed nearby. Lastly, special flight rules areas, like this one around the Grand Canyon here, are depicted outlined in this blue castle top pattern. That covers special use airspace. Up next, we have communication and nav aids. In this section, we will cover a bunch of acronyms. VORs, FSS, RCOs, NDBs. We'll start with VORs. VORs, or Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range, are depicted inside of these compass roses falling all over the charts. VORs fall under three categories, normal VORs, Vortex, VOR stations with TACAN capability used by the military, and VOR DMEs, or VORs with distancing measuring equipment capabilities. Keep in mind that these compass roses were all set to magnetic north in the year they were built, so the zero degree or north reference arrow of one VOR compass rose may differ greatly from the next. Inside of the compass rows, we'll find a box with some information, like the VOR station name, the frequency, the identifier, and that Morse code noise that we should hear when we've tuned into the VOR. 
Flight service station information can also be depicted in this box if there is a flight service station nearby. The name of the nearest flight service station is listed underneath with the frequencies listed on top. This underline designates a frequency with no transmitting capabilities. If a frequency is followed by an R, that means that the flight service station only receives messages on that frequency. They will typically transmit messages on the VOR frequency. Notice it is not underlined. In this case, we will have to make sure we're using COM1 in the cockpit to transmit on frequency 122.1 and listening in on COM2 for Cedar City's response on frequency 112.3. RCOs, depicted similarly to flight service stations, are remote communications outlets. These are radio towers set up to extend the communications capabilities of flight service stations. You will see them scattered throughout the charts. The idea is for the pilot to make calls to the RCO frequency as if they were making the call directly to the flight service station itself. Lastly, we have non-directional radio beacons, or NDBs like this one. These ground-based nav aids are pretty ancient and today are not commonly used in flight or flight training, so we won't cover them further than this general description and a picture of what they look like on the charts. This covers nav and comm aids. Up next, we have miscellaneous items. Significant VFR waypoints, like my house here, are depicted by flags with an underlined name. Oftentimes, checkpoints will have a five-digit code that can be used for flight planning purposes. ATC must be familiar with these locations. Victor Airways are charted as these long blue strips running all along the charts. The VOR radial it follows is depicted and further along we would find the name, a two or three digit numerical code preceded by a V. Lastly, we've got the miscellaneous activity areas depicted by this guy. G for glider, U for ultralight, alpha is for aerobatic, H for hang glider, and Uniform Alpha for unmanned aircraft. The parachute depicts areas where there may be heavy parachuting activity. A space shuttle would depict a space launch area. The next two items are shown only on TAC charts. The less detailed sectional chart does not include them. VFR transition routes through Bravo airspace are depicted by double-sided red arrows with instructions typically listed nearby and on the back of the chart. IFR arrival and departure corridors are shown as well, depicted by light gray chevrons. These help us to avoid the paths of large aircraft flying under IFR, with pilots focused on instrument approaches or departures. It is a really good idea to steer clear of these. Arrivals are depicted by the paths with an aircraft, and departure paths are depicted without an aircraft. The last thing we'll cover in this video is the tabulation of the charts. The tabs offer us some really helpful information. In order from top to bottom, we've got a list of all control tower frequencies and operating hours, approach control frequencies, a list of restricted airspace including the altitude limits of the restricted area, times of use, controlling agency names, and frequencies. Below that, military operating area information is presented in the same format as restricted airspace. And lastly, below that is a list of VFR waypoints. We find the same items in the tabs of the TAC chart. The VFR sectional has the same format map on both sides. The TAC charts have VFR flyway planning charts on the back, depicting more detail to aid in the transition through the Bravo airspace, especially under VFR. To the left of this map, at the bottom left corner of the chart, we find further instruction regarding flight through Bravo airspace through the VFR corridors. This concludes today's video over charting symbology. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this long, boring video. I hope it's left you feeling much more confident with reading the sectional and tack charts. If it has, I hope that you might like this video or share it with someone else who might find it helpful. If you haven't already, please feel welcome to subscribe to the channel and to hit the bell button to enable notifications for future posts. Feedback is always greatly appreciated in the comments section. Thanks again and safe flying.